water, known as slick water, and disinfectant to prevent bacteria growth. Sand or clay is also mixed into the water to prop open the fissures so the gas and oil can keep leaking out even after the pressure is released. It's estimated that all of fracking's intense pumping and flushing uses an average of three to six million gallons of water per well. That's actually not a lot compared to agriculture, power plants, or even golf course maintenance, but it can have a notable impact on local water supply. And disposing of used fracking water is also an issue. Along with the trapped gas that's pumped up to the surface, millions of gallons of flowback liquid come gushing up. This liquid, containing contaminants like radioactive material, salts, heavy metals, and hydrocarbons, needs to be stored and disposed of. That's usually done in pits on site, in deep wells, or off site at water treatment facilities. Another option is to recycle the flowback liquid, but the recycling process can actually increase levels of contamination since the water is more toxic with each use. Wells are typically encased in steel and cement to prevent contaminants from leaking into groundwater, but any negligence or fracking-related accidents can have devastating effects. Fracturing directly into underground water, hazardous underground seepage and leakage, and inadequate treatment and disposal of highly toxic wastewater can potentially contaminate drinking water around a fracking site. There's also concern about the threat of earthquakes and damaged infrastructure from pressure and wastewater injection. Links between fracking and increased seismic activity leave unresolved questions about long-term pressure imbalances that might be happening deep beneath our feet. Fracking's biggest controversy, though, is happening above the ground. The general consensus is that burning natural gas is better for the environment than burning coal since the gas collected from fracking emits only half the carbon dioxide as coal per unit of energy. The pollution caused by the fracking itself, though, isn't negligible. Methane that leaks out during the drilling and pumping process is many times more potent than carbon dioxide as a greenhouse gas. Some scientists argue that methane eventually dissipates, so has a relatively low long-term impact. But a greater question hangs in the air. Does fracking take time, money, and research away from the development of cleaner, renewable energy sources? Natural gas is non-renewable, and the short-run economic interests supporting fracking may fall short in the face of global climate change. Experts are still examining fracking's overarching effects. Although modern fracking has been around since the 1940s, it's boomed in the last few decades as other sources of natural gas decrease the costs of non-renewable energies rise, and cutting-edge technologies make it so accessible. But many countries and regions have already banned fracking in response to environmental concerns. It's undeniable that fracking has reshaped the energy landscape around the world. But for what long-term benefit, and at what cost? So that is some of the, oh, a general overview of fracking. Um, and so we're gonna kind of, I guess pun intended, drill down into what's going on in Colorado and in Erie. Um, the first recorded well, vertical um, well, not horizontal fracking was um, in 1901 in Colorado and it was drilled in the Pierre Shell Formation. Um, and in 1969, an early form of hydraulic fracking was, was used near Rifle. Um, and according to the Leeds School of Business, fracking occurred in the Wardenburg gas field in 1973. We um, are on the DJ Basin, Denver Julesburg Basin. And that's where the fracking around Erie occurs. This is a map of all the 80,000 fracking wells in Colorado. Um, as you can see, well, you can't really see the area wherein it's covered, um, but this is what we're looking at for our state. This comes from the Denver Post. Um, and another resource which we can put in the chat is 
the oil and gas threat map, which shows um, actively fracked sites. There are many of them occurring in our area here. And the next slide is a, a photo I want. Um, Sandra, if you could talk a little bit about this. Um, I, this was uh, air so this, um, quality. We have some consumer grade air quality monitors scattered around the state, um, one of which is right across from May J. And during one of the low wind, stagnant wind um, times that we had recently, we um, took a snapshot of what the air quality in Colorado looked like at the time. And if you compare this map to the map with all the wells that Kate just shows, you can see a pretty clear correlation between where the highest concentration of wells is and where we see the, the worst air quality when air quality is poor. Oh, sorry, here's a picture of what fracking looks like in Colorado. Um, Cause a lot of people think of those like grasshopper wells. That's not fracking, that's like the vertical fracking or bit of vertical um oil drilling fracking when it starts it you have a huge oil rig here but later on you see all these different kind of iterations um and if you go back to that first um picture we saw of erie you can see almost all the different stages of fracking happening just um around here i think um and Sandra, if you could talk about this a little bit, I think one of these is the May J pad. I think this one's Yellowhammer and this is Papa Joe over in Weld uh, County, is that right? I think you're uh, I think you're right. The one on the very right is May J, which is the first oh. pad that we um, started fracking um, at. And then the one directly to the left of that is the Papa Joe. Now set. that's, uh, oh, that's, that's a, yellow. One? That's just a different uh, kind of auxiliary site that's infrastructure. So beyond May J, those walls up there, when this picture was taken, that was Papa Joe. Yeah. So that's the one that is um, undergoing fracking right now. And the walls weren't put up yet when this picture was taken, but there is another well called yellow hammer, which is beyond that one as well. So if we were put them all together, that kind of brown field next to Papa Joe is about where, uh, I mean, it's all brown, but that's where yellow hammer is right now. Yeah. Okay, thanks. And in my deck, I've got some additional slides that show some of the overviews there. Okay, fantastic. Um, so that's what we have for kind of our overview. Um, and I'm going to pass it to Sandra and Eric, who are going to kind of share a rebroadcast about some of the um, uh, some of the air and climate impacts. Yeah. So just a brief um, preview. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, Colorado 350 hosted Tour de Frac, which had brought together a bunch of experts to talk about the fracking process, um, and we wanted to highlight a couple of them. Um, one was a presentation from uh, Devil Helming about um, who owns Boulder Air, which is a local company that does um, air quality monitoring that we're advocating for here in Erie. Um, and he gives an overview of um, how the system works and the overall impacts of uh, oil and gas. So I was asked to talk about air and climate impacts in 10 minutes. There's some 10 or so fracking wicks active here in Colorado or in the front range, more or less. And there are something like 25,000 wells. So when, when it comes to the air quality, uh, climate impacts, it's not really the fracking sites themselves that cause you know, the, the overwhelming abundance of the, the impacts. It's the whole system, it's the infrastructure. There's, there's wells, there's pipelines, there's flaring, there's transportation, there's processing. So the fracking kind of accommodates the oil and gas development, but the fracking sites itself is actually a small number. Over the last four years, um, a much more sophisticated network has been established. And I show that here with these, these stars. Um, there's, there's five of these continuous monitoring sites right now. We can see how they relate to the oil and gas wells which are all these, these, these dots here on this map. And there's two in Longmont, one at the Boulder Reservoir, and two in Broomfield. 
and to show you who's paying for this. It's actually you, <laughs> mostly through, through um, tax money, but it's, it's funded by the city of Longmont, um, Border County, um, the city PHE, and also the city and county of Broomfield. So um, I will just show you a few examples of how this, this works and the sort of data we get from this. What's unique here is that these observations, they're happening right now all the time. This is working continuously and it's going within minutes to a public website or several websites um, so that anybody out there can follow this at any time. Here, here, here. Um, and these, these, these results have been plotted on these websites and tables and the graphs. There's some examples that show you actually um, all of these put together in some of these graphs. Um, the top three are just the meteorology, but then if you look at the lower graphs, you see three base of data, um, showing sort of methane, ozone, nitric oxide, and then it keeps going and going. There's many, many others um, included here. So this gives you the opportunity to actually watch these different air pollutants um, in your neighborhood um, around the corner. Um, so show you some examples what we're seeing in this. Um, first of all, this is a comparison um, of the air that moves into the region. Um, and here we use some data from Nywood Ridge, which is up the mountains near the Peak Highway, and then the Boulder Reservoir. And then some of you may have seen this already, but I really like this slide um, because it shows so nicely the very stark difference in concentrations we see once you're down here in the front ridge, this basin, where these um, emissions accumulate. So this is um, one of these oil and gas tracers, ethane, and these graphs are of the same scale, and it shows ethane at Nywood Ridge and the ethnic from the Boulder Reservoir. And you can see very nicely how at the Boulder Reservoir it goes up and down, up and down, up and down all year round. This is a year and a half of data, and levels there are much, much higher overall than in the air that's moving into the region. Um, this now moves um, the data into just a three months uh, or six months window. This is another compound that's methane we're concerned about as a climate gas. And this shows the data from Boulder to the Longmont side, to the Bloomfield side. And again, it shows a little bit nicer how it goes up and down, up and down, up and down. We have these, these types all the time, any time of the year. Um, and, and that uh, causes methane to go up. Um, very, very quickly, I think the next slide, yeah, zooms in just in one of those spikes. So this is from the Longmont Human Reservoir. You see how, how short this is. This is just a 14 minute duration where methane goes up by a factor of uh, 15. The background is two parts per million, and it went all about 30 here, and just for 15 minutes. So that's important to, to understand when you live here. Um, you know, it's not like the air is always heavy and rich of these pollutants, but it goes up and down all the time. It spikes, it jumps around. Um, very quickly, and the closer you are to these oil and gas development areas, the more of these spikes you get, the higher these spikes you get. Um, so having this much data would be very nice to look at the dependency of these elevated concentrations uh, by wind direction. So that you see on the left side here is the wind rose, and it shows the, so the concentration of these the oil and gas tracers and um, these different wind sectors. And you can see, you know, when the winds come from the north, the east, the southeast, there's a lot of red, um, which is, you know, air flow from that come over the oil and gas area, much more frequent, much more high concentrations, whereas air flow from the west over the mountains are blue, very um, much lower levels. Um, and then we can take this further and further where we, you know, we do this, we take measurements every minute and we combine you know, thousands of these measurements, we get these, these, these heat maps where you um, kind of figure yourself in the middle of this map. This is where the site is, which is this data of the Longmont. And you can see here the signatures, these are ratios of VOCs. So when air comes from the north and from the east, can see how different these chemical signatures are, the different the, the composition of the atmosphere is depending on 
um, where the air comes from and how windy is it. So this goes from low wind speeds to high wind speeds. So even if it's windy and the air comes from the north, you can see a much different signature than the air that comes from the west. So we have very nice tools in our hands to, to see these um, chemical signatures from the cat side. And um, so I'm going to show you one more nice case example we have here. This is from the Bloomfield sites where we um, observe the end of the living site. If you think about the night, this is the most defined, really defined signature we've seen with elevated concentrations here in the settling and the benzene, and just from this very narrowly defined uh, sector here. And uh, if you Look at this closer on the map here. You can see um, the Livingston site is right here. Um, so we have data from another site because there's two of these sites in the second one. And when we look a little bit from here, you can see that the plumes come from here. Um, here they come from here. And it overlaps, crosses over right here. Um, so can the, the well paths. Very nice example that shows you how the you can get these elevated oil and gas tracers when you get flow in the sun of this facility. Um, thanks for this opportunity, Keith, and thanks, uh, thanks to all of you for your okay. Thanks for sharing that info from a Boulder Air. It's super important. Um, I, and now we're moving on to the neighborhood panel, which is going to be a great time to ask questions. We've got Sandra and Eric and Jeff and Kelsey, right? Oh, there you are, Kelsey. Hi. So, and Christiane. So I'm going to let them take over and talk about what's happening in Erie. Hi, everyone. Um, we are a group of Collier's Hill neighbors and um, Christiane, who was with us from Erie Protectors, to chat a little bit about uh, fracking in Erie specifically and um, what we can expect at the site north of Collier's Hill um, now and in the near future. So we'll just be um, chatting to you a little bit about that and sharing some photos with you guys, but feel free to ask questions. Um, you can ask in the chat or if you feel like voicing a question, just do the little um, raise your hand feature or unmute yourselves and um, we'll, we'll chat. Christian? Yeah, so I was gonna just start with the brief presentation um, that goes over a little bit of how we got here and um, what we're dealing with in particular with the infrastructure that we're seeing north of Collier's Hill. So let me uh, get things sorted here. Good. All right. So one funny thing that I wanted to, to mention about Project Rulison um, that, that Kate mentioned early on, that actually um, Project Rulison was a, a part of a larger project called Project Plowshare, where in the late 60s, um, the Department of Energy had a program whereby they wanted to find non-wartime uses for nuclear bombs. And there are two sites in Colorado and one in New Mexico um, Project Rulison is one of them, and Project Rio Blanco is the other. Um, these are in and around Parachute and Rifle, Colorado, where they dropped a 40 kiloton nuclear bomb, three times the size of Hiroshima, um, down a 7,000 foot hole um, near Parachute. And uh, I went there, <laughs> and this is, the, this is the only thing that you can see at, at the surface, that there was a, a 40 kiloton nuclear bomb detonated. Um, it created a crater that was about 180 feet across. Um, they drilled a well and they, uh, they tapped into the, the methane that was there. And uh, to everybody's shock, 
they found that the methane was too contaminated with radioactivity to be commercially saleable. Um, so they vented and, and flared all of that natural gas away. And uh, very curiously, there's a home that's about 200 feet away from this little marker. So when we talk about um, oil and gas in Erie, um, I'll, I'll show the live version later. But um, to understand that the town of Erie has about 105 producing wells of a total of 146 than what we're calling in an active state. And as a fraction of what we see in Weld County, um, it's 146 of about 19,000 wells. So this is what it looks like regionally. Um, this is the denver julesburg Basin. Um, we are at the southwest corner there, outlined in blue. That is the municipal boundaries of the town of Erie. Um, and Collier's Hill is kind of nestled in the top segment there. When we look at the town of Erie, um, here is a slightly more detailed view um, that shows the various wells, either legacy vertical or directional wells, and some of the horizontal drilling that's been happening um, since the popularization of that technology in the last 15 years or so. A little bit of a more clear picture um, that out of those 100 odd wells that are active in Erie, um, a lot of them are those antiquated pump jacks that you'll see in some of the farmland um, that's closer to the, the edges of Erie or small little brown tanks that you'll see um, in and around your neighborhoods. But here are the major fracking operations that have been in play since about 2014. Um, that uh, for people like me, we dealt with uh, waste connections in Pratt and Kaidi Trails. Um, but early on, there was Morgan Hills and Woolly Becky Sosa. Um, and currently, we're dealing with issues at uh, May J, Papa Joe, and Schumacher. This is a more detailed view of what's happening at the May J, Papa Joe, and Schumacher sites. So to give everybody a little bit of an orientation here, um, on the right-hand side of these blue lines is Candy Road 5. And what kind of slices through the middle of it is Candy Road 10. So here we have the Erie High School. And here we have the community of Collier's Hill. And what I'm showing here are the, the well pads of May J, Papa Joe, and Yellowhammer. And what we have here are the directional well bores. So when we have these hydraulic fracturing wells, they will drill down, in this case, about 7,500 feet. And they will either drill north or south along that layer of shale to then frack and do flowback and have the oil and natural gas and produced water come back out of that horizontal bore to the surface. Getting an even closer look, um, we have a fair amount of oil and gas infrastructure here. This is all data, again, from the COGCC's GIS applications. Um, as a regular user, um, they're free and available to the public to use. But what I wanted to point out here um, is that we have a legacy slash old abandoned location called Schumacher. We have the May J pad which is where 12 wells were recently drilled, or 12 wells were recently fracked. Got to get uh, terminology right there. Um, <clears throat> in the middle of it all, we have Papa Joe and Yellowhammer. And those sets of wells there are considered to be one location, as is May J, and as is Schumacher. And the reason that a lot of us are here this evening um, is because the May J site, when it was originally permitted, was not near homes. But in the time between the drilling and the fracking of May J, we now have homes that are within 950 feet um, of that first well and within 400 feet of the protection facilities to its south. So here's an aerial view of the Yellowhammer site, 
when it was being drilled in 2017. Just to the, the left hand side of this picture to the east is the Papa Joe site. And what you can't really see at all um, is the May J site around here, but to show that um, at that point in 2017 for Collier's Hill, the northern phases of that development hadn't yet been built. So the, the impact to residents um, wasn't nearly as bad as what we're experiencing now. So to really understand like how did we get here um, in terms of this very unique situation. So first I'd like to go through the abandoned location of Schumacher that originally the, the intent was to drill 20 wells at Schumacher. So in June of 2017, a form 2A, which is the COGCC's term for a location permit application was submitted to the COGCC. And that's the process by which an operator will ask for permission to drill from a surface location. A form two is a set of associated permits for each individual well. So that application for that form two was submitted in June of 2017. It was approved by the COGCC in October of that year. But what happened in November of 2018 is that those form twos for that location were abandoned. And with that notification um, from the operator, they advertised that that location has not been constructed and the site will not be used in the future. Together with um, that form 2A that was filed in 2017, those permits have a, a lifetime of three years. So when that permit was approved in October 2017, started a three-year clock. And that three-year clock ran out in October of 2020. So at this point for that Schumacher pad, that the Form 2A has expired, and if anybody were to ever want to come back and drill at that particular location, they would have to file a new Form 2A with the COGCC. So that's already an awful lot of um, <laughs> information. Are there any questions about that Schumacher pad and how we got to where we are with that particular site? I think we should also note that um, Schumacher is within Erie um, boundaries, whereas the other sites uh, are part of an annexation to uh, unincorporated Weld County. Do we know why it was abandoned? We, we don't um, exactly. So what, what Sandra was referencing here is that the Schumacher pad, um, what's in the, the mustardy yellow color here is the municipal boundaries of the town of Erie. So the location within the town of Erie was abandoned and they decided to drill from the May J and the Papa Joe and Yellowhammer sites instead. And if that map looks a little sketchy to you, um, it should. Yes. So for, for Papa Joe and Yellowhammer, um, a similar situation in 2017 that uh, a Form 2A was submitted and approved in September of that year. But what happened differently at Papa Joe and Yellowhammer from Schumacher is that in October 2017, um, Kerr McGee slash Anadarko slash Occidental, depending on how you want to call them via their various acquisitions, they filed what was called a Form 42. And that was a notice of construction. And I've noted that at both the Papa Joe and Meiji locations, because that's what kind of like strikes out the expiration of a permit. So once construction begins at a location, that form 2A for the location is valid until all of the wells have been plugged and abandoned 
and the entire location has been restored to its previous state. Which can take 30 years. 30, 30 years. years. Yes. So that really is the answer to the question for anybody of, hey, how come they were able to come back and drill multiple years later? And the answer is that the moment that they submitted that Form 42 and they, they started construction on that site, that Form 2A is now valid, all right? So then the next thing that happened at Papa Joe in October of 2017 is a process called sputting began. And that is um, the very beginning of the, the construction of a well where a, a surface casing will be drilled and that really goes down to a depth below the water table. And the intent there is to protect the surface and to protect the groundwater from contamination. And after, shortly afterward, those wells were drilled. But what we have in a like a, almost a four year delay now is that between sputting and drilling and then hydraulic fracturing took that three and a half year time frame. But again, they were allowed to do that because of that form 42 and the beginning of sputting. So the same thing happened at May J, where several years later, in 2019 in February, they submitted a Form 2A to the COGCC. In August of that year, the Form 2A was approved. And within several weeks, the Form 42 was submitted with the notice of construction. And in September 2019, sputting and drilling began. So that then stopped the clock on the permit expiring. And now that is an active site um, where in February of this year, hydraulic fracturing began. And in March of this year, the flowback operations began. So I think one thing that would be really useful, well, we're gonna watch a brief presentation about some of the health impacts of fracking um, next, but one thing that would be really useful would be to talk briefly about which site is at what stage uh, right now um, and what we can expect during those stages. Um, some of the things that us as neighbors, Kelsey, Jeff, and whoever else wants to pitch in really have been trying to do to keep ourselves safer. Um, and maybe talk a little bit about why air quality monitoring is important and some further steps we, we want to take. So maybe Christiane, if you could pull up that um, those dates one more time. Um, sure. So as you can see there, the first um, one of our active sites here that got um, fracked was the May J site, which started in um, early February. And the active fracking at that site has since concluded. Is that right, Christian? Yes. And the so they are currently either about to begin or have already began the flow back at that site at the May J location. Correct. Um, and what, what that means um, in terms of toxicity to us, uh, maybe we can speak a little bit about the difference between what happens during fracturing versus flow back. Yeah. So in, in terms of you know, the, the nuisances and the risks that are presented during the various phases, um, during sputting, the, the nuisance is really in truck traffic and noise from the, the drilling equipment, um, that can be lessened if the operator uses an electric drilling rig as opposed to a diesel um, engine-based one. Um, most of the industry is moving toward electric rigs wherever they can do it. Um, it really depends on having nearby power infrastructure, i.e. connecting to the grid 
in a substantial enough way. Uh, the other big issue during drilling is that uh, the operators have like hydraulic fracturing technology has advanced over the years in terms of the drilling mud that they can use. So imagine that you're trying to drill a hole that goes 7,500 feet down and then takes a left-hand turn and keeps on going for several miles. Um, so the, there's intense friction and pressures that come to play there. And um, the technology of what kind of a drilling mud so that that pipe can be pushed through those several miles of distance um, is a source of odor nuisances and also um, carries volatile organic compounds in terms of benzene um, and the, the other small chain hydrocarbons that you see in that drilling mud. Once you get to the, the hydraulic fracturing phase where they're pumping that propent, so that's the, the silica, the sand, um, lots of water and a cocktail of chemicals, um, surfactants and antimicrobial kind of um, antibacterial agents, that kind of thing. Um, the risk there is more in the noise from the hydraulic pumps. Um, it's the, the continuous stream of trucks that come in carrying the, the frac sand and the frac chemicals um, and the, the constant noise and light that comes from that site. In flowback is where you're actually trying to get back out that first bit of oil, natural gas, and produced water. And that's very dirty. So the risk in flowback is really about um, fire and explosion because you're, you're releasing for the first time that incredible pressure that's stored underground, um, that the equipment that's used for flowback is less efficient than the equipment that's used during production. So there's additional risk in terms of air quality um, for volatile organic compounds that are released into the air. As that first bit of oil and natural gas comes back, um, they will often attempt to flare that natural gas. Um, and depending on the efficiency of that combustion device, that uh, additional volatile organic compounds may escape into the air. And of course, there's additional truck traffic um, that causes noise and odor issues as well. And do we know of the sites um, closest to Collier's Hill, so May J, Papa Joe, and Yellowhammer, are those diesel or electric? So when those wells were drilled, I believe they were diesel. But that happened back in 2017 and 2019, respectively. Um, so if you've heard the last couple nights the fracking going on, what you're hearing is Papa Joe. They began, a, it, it says uh, the 31st there, but it, we got an, a, a little advanced notice present. So they've actually started already at Papa Joe. Yellowhammer is the 31st. And Yellowhammer will start on the 31st. Um, so lots of activity going on and we will get to a point where all three are active, um, although at different stages um, and have different correlated risks um, to consider. But um, if all goes as planned, uh, we should be done with flow back at all sites by when, Christian, do you think? So, Hydraulic fracturing and flowback each take about a week per well. So if every well is like the, the frack begins or is underway by the 1st of April, we're expecting that by April 15th or so that flowback will have completed at all of those wells. And at that point, do they stop being um, toxic? Do they stop um, emitting any cancerous gases, et cetera? They don't. Um, and, and this is where we get into the, the core of, of the conversation as to why the um, exploration and production and ultimately the consumption of natural gas is actually worse for the environment than coal. 
And while natural gas is a cleaner burning fuel, uh, the, the big issue with natural gas is during the, the fracking and all of this completions operation, we tend to see a spike in VOCs emitted into the air. But during production as well, we have an issue of fugitive emissions, meaning that every time you have a, a valve or a compressor station or a tanker truck that transfers natural gas from one area to another, that there's a chance for something to leak. And at a point, um, it's about 1.5% is the, the tipping point where natural gas becomes worse for the environment than does burning coal. And that's because methane, which is one of the major contributors of the volatile organic compounds that come out of these fugitive emissions, is 80 times more powerful a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. Um, Christian, would you mind uh, unsharing your screen? Thank you. Um, so one of the things that um, we've come to learn as we've uh, gotten to learn about fracking, about the situation here in Erie specifically, is uh, what to expect at uh, different stages um, can be really empowering um, and just knowing how to be prepared and how you can um, try to stay as safe as possible. Um, so one of the things that we advise when um, active fracking is happening and during flowback is that you keep your windows closed. If you are within, within they say within 2,000 feet, um, we are a, a little bit over 2,000 feet and we certainly are still keeping our windows closed um, during these next few months. Jeff, um, he is much closer to the sites. He's more closer to that 1,000 foot window. Can you speak a little bit about what you guys have been doing and how you guys have been coping? Yeah, so I mean, like one of the, the biggest things for us is um, like investing in air purifiers. So trying to have at least peace of mind with that um, has been pretty helpful. Um, and so, you know, taking a look and seeing if we can get like data. So this kind of goes back to why we're asking the board of trustees for Erie to invest in one of like the Boulder air type solutions. So we have a little bit sooner of a readout on what might be in the air that we can't necessarily, you know, like see, or you can maybe smell a little bit, but um, just knowing that like you have a purification system is probably a good peace of mind. Um, noise, noise is like the, ne the next biggest complaint, especially if you're close to the sites. So knowing what to do with um, like truck noise and traffic noise and street sweepers noise that keeps running every day. Um, so, you know, keeping your windows closed because the street, sweep, the, the street sweeper is, you know, obviously just pushing all the stuff off the ground from the trucks that are coming and going from those sites. Um, those are just some helpful tips. Um, and then, yeah, just, I mean, like your HVAC systems, you can buy the filters from like Home Depot or Lowe's. Um, if you want to go that method, you can get like the more intense filters that say they can do some of the VOC, um, like contaminant collections. Um, that's kind of been what we've did, what we've been seeing. And I think the biggest part portion of this later on in our meeting tonight will be how do we deal with like complaints when you, you know, smell something or you hear something bad. Um, we'll get to some of the resources that you can use, but um, doing that kind of early and often, I think will help as well. Um, because those are data points that can be um, used if collectively we all, you know, hear or smell something bad. I, um, I totally agree. I think one of the most important things you can invest on is a air purifier for your home, um, particularly if you live within those 2000 feet. Um, and when you're shopping for air purifiers, it's important to look for one that filters out VOCs and other gases. Um, there's a lot of air purifiers out there that just do dander and dust and um, good stuff, but um, doesn't help us a whole lot in our situation. So important to do your research when you're shopping for those. Um, and one more thing, and maybe Kelsey, because she has little ones, can help a little, uh, talk a little bit about this too, but just minimizing your outdoor exposure is a challenge. Um, but we are trying to go a little bit further for parks um, when we're exercising, trying to stay away from the sites as much as possible. Um, so trying to minimize your exposure is another thing you can do to protect you and your family. 
Yeah, I mean, um, I'll, I'll just chime in briefly, but you, given the number of wells in Weld County and in Erie, it's hard to always find a place that um, isn't, you know, within the 2000 foot um, setback limit in Erie to feel safer. Um, so a big thing that my family does is look at the particulates level. Um, as many of you might have seen last week, I think it was, that we had that inversion of the cold weather and it trapped in the particulates. And I know it's not a one-to-one -one correlation with VOCs and the harmful things coming from oil and gas, but that is our pollution. And um, you'll, you know, if you check the, the maps around the area, you can tell which days, like, you probably don't want to go work out outside and those kind of things. Don't take your kids out. So, and while it's always a useful tool to have those at home um, monitoring devices, just keep in mind that it's they're not measuring everything that we would need to measure. So that's why we need to keep advocating and investing in um, continuous air quality monitoring for our community so that we are all aware and all have the best information. Because um, it's hard to piece all of this together and, and interpret what, what one monitor says versus the other, et cetera. Um, there's a question in the chat that I'm hoping Christiane can help me with. I think I know the answer, but I don't want to say it wrong. Um, the Occidental, so Majay's operators said that they were using trucks to remove gas and oil waste, um, that they were not going to use trucks to remove gas and oil waste. Is that true? So from what I recall during completions that they expected um, to need about 160 truck trips per well during the completions operations. So over the, the next several months, we were looking at about 7,500 truck trips. And then um, do we have the coordinates for each site so that we can calculate distance? Um, we, we don't, but they're all available on the COGCC website, so you can Look there. Um, one thing that we found useful on, on there is that there's a map where you can see um, where all the active wells are too. So Kelsey was alluding to, you know, it's hard to find a place that's within 200 feet of anything, but um, there's relativity to that. You know, it's better to be uh, 2000 feet from a capped well than it is from an active fracking site. Um, so knowing, knowing the area is, is a, a really empowering thing that you can do too. And I think the, the big thing it was glossed over really quick in the Boulder Air presentation, but there's fluctuations all the time and it's highly related to um, just the wind. Uh, what we saw last week, the inversion when the air was still, that's kind of like the base weather or base pollution in the Denver area. We have very bad air, largely because of all this oil and gas activity um, in Weld County. And it kind of, it shifts over to the West and it heads over. Um, so we're hoping to have kind of a whole front range network combined with Broomfield, Longmont and Boulder so that you can really see these spikes so that even as we get into summer, we have now both this problem of flowback where we could have a lot of volatile organic compounds in the air that are cause cancer risk and then you kind of have this thing okay we don't want to have our windows open but there's also not necessarily an ever-present threat so if you have active air quality monitoring you have a better understanding of what the situation is outside and we can have more collective information and peace of mind as a community um and we're gonna watch a little video um just in a couple minutes about some of the health implications of fracking. Because right now, I'm, I'm sure if this is your first time learning about all of this, you're wondering, you know, so what um, to a lot of what we're sharing. But before we do that, I just want to give us a brief overview of where we are in terms of air quality monitoring here in Erie um, and what we're um, advocating for and working towards. So when um, the site's first began active fracking. We inquired about air quality monitoring and were told that there is air quality monitoring being done by Occidental Petroleum. Um, and basically we're not privy to that information just yet, but we're told that they're following all of the rules um, based on just symptoms that we're sharing. And then, you know, random odor, we had sneaky suspicions that they are not. And so we, we have um, some, um, which I mentioned earlier, consumer grade um, air quality monitoring that was spiking um, and 
reached out to the town to see what they could do in terms of air quality monitoring, and they are currently weighing options. So Christian, maybe you can um, share a little bit more about what, what that process looks like and what, what our options are. So this is where um, I will probably say less than I could, given my dual role, not only as uh, an activist <laughs> with the Erie Protectors, but also as a trustee with the town of Erie. So my, my presence at this meeting is very much as an activist um, and not as an elected official. But certainly one of the options for the town of Erie in terms of how it moves forward with air quality monitoring is to become a part of the Boulder Air Network. So as Sandra mentioned earlier, that uh, the, the original air quality monitoring station is in Boulder, that Broomfield contracted with Boulder Air to put two air quality monitoring stations next to the extraction pads in Broomfield, um, that Longmont has an air quality monitoring station, that Fort Collins is in discussions to acquire one as well. Um, and in terms of participating in a, in a regional network where not only could we track the, the long-term health impacts and the atmospheric presence of oil and gas VOCs regionally because of the 20,000 odd active wells in Weld County and a predominant southwestern wind direction, um, it's also a matter of being able to track specific localized events. So let, let's say something happens in Windsor well, first it'll get picked up by the, the monitoring station in Longmont and then Erie and then perhaps Broomfield. So that will give um, these municipalities a bit of a more regional and cooperative look at how oil and gas impacts our air quality regionally. Um, the city and county of Broomfield has also contracted with another company um, called Ajax, which is associated to CSU in Fort Collins to do some monitoring there as well. Um, there are other opportunities. The town of Erie has a, uh, an arrangement with a consultant firm called CGRS, um, and they have done SUMA canister monitoring at, the, um, a, at a resident's home very close to the May J pad, um, that the CDPHE has what's called a CAMEL, which is a a very sophisticated air quality monitoring trailer that they're able to move from site to site to site that uh, is currently present in Longmont. Um, and sadly, they only have one of them. Ergo, it's not available for use at the May J and Papa Joe and Yellowhammer pads. Um, that's about the, the, the state of the, the range of air quality monitoring solutions. Yep. Um, you know, the, the Boulder Air Solutions, uh, depending on the installation, started about $150,000 just to install um, and go up to about $400,000, but they cost somewhere between one and $200,000 to run every year in terms of um, the sampling frequency and the, the consumables in those installations, as well as building and maintaining websites to share that data with the public. Um, as Sandra also mentioned, Occidental has their own air quality monitoring solution in place. And um, in accordance with their permit, they are providing monthly summaries of that air quality monitoring to the COGCC, Weld County, and the town of Erie. Let's watch the next video we have clipped here. Um, and while we're doing that, if you have any other questions, please answer them in the chat. Um, lots of us are here available to answer questions. If you feel more comfortable private messaging one of us, um, you can do that also. Sandra, did you wanna address the couple questions that did come in? One was about air monitoring at your home that you could purchase and one was what air purifiers we'd recommend. Yep, so one of the questions here is, are there air quality monitors that we can buy and use at our homes? Um, the short answer to that is not really. Um, the, what, the type of equipment we need to measure VOCs and other cancer um, causing toxins is very expensive, like 
in the six figures. That's why we need the town of Erie to purchase it for us um, and to have a continuous monitoring station that, um, that we can all benefit from. There are some consumer level sensors like Purple Air, which is what Jeff has and which we have been tracking particulate uh, matter spikes in. Um, it's not exactly the, the data, the fact those two don't always correlate exactly. So it's not the best uh, data to go from, but it might help you feel safer um, at home. So if that's something you want to look into, um, you can definitely do that. Um, as far as air purifiers that we would recommend, um, there's a lot of different brands that filter out VOCs. If you Google it, the first thing that'll come up is a molecule, which um, are excellent quality, I hear. Uh, some of us um, have them. Um, they're a little bit pricier. You can also get Austin Air, which is what we have here and we, we, we trust which is a similar technology with the carbon filters. Um, Blue Air is another good brand. And I think, Ke Kelsey, do you have a Conway? Is that right? It's a Coway, C-O-W-A-Y, Air Mega. Um, we just invested in one for every bedroom and one for our great room. The so. key thing that you have to be careful with the air purifiers is they have a range um, of how effective they are. Um, so. If you want full protection, what we do is we have one for our great room, and then you may want ones in your bedroom specifically as well, and they can be different sizes. And in general, the key thing that you want to look for is it to be one that has carbon filters. And we'll, we'll during the presentation, we'll talk a little bit about the health impacts of fracking and how they are most acutely felt by um, expectant moms and young children. So if I had young kids, I would certainly put air purifiers in their bedrooms. Um, that it's all a matter of prioritizing in your home, but those are just some of the things we've been doing. Are we ready? So this next uh, clip also from the Tour de Frac um, concerns um, studies around the health effects um, from fracking um, from the Physicians for Social Responsibility. And for those who are on the call and who are caring about this issue. Um, these next two slides, you can go to the first one. Um, these, two, these two statements are from the seventh edition of the Compendium of Scientific Medical and Media Findings Demonstrating Risk and Harm of Fracking. Quite a mouthful. And this basically summarizes PSR Colorado's stance on health and fracking, that there's no evidence that it can be practiced in a manner that does not threaten human health directly and without imperiling climate change. Um, the next statement, we'll go to the next slide. The risk and harms of fracking are inherent to its operation. The only method of mitigating its grave threats to public health and the climate is a complete and comprehensive ban on fracking. This study was a recent one that came up in the compendium. 43 chemicals are classified as known as human human reproductive toxicants, while 31 others are suspected human reproductive toxicants. Um, the studies that follow, I'll be going through, they're all population studies. Um, a retrospective study of mothers in Colorado that occurred between 1996 and 2009 found that mothers in rural Colorado who had babies born with neural tube defects were twice as likely to live in the highest density of wells as compared to those who had no wells within a 10 mile radius. Uh, another study that was done, uh, this study was done by the Colorado State Public Health, Dr. Lisa McKenzie. Um, she found that uh, babies born to mothers um, with congenital heart defects of 30% are at one point three times more likely to live in the highest density of wells compared to those with no wells in the 10 mile radius. And this, this study is significant because um, this study was. Um, the Colorado uh, Department of Public Health did an evaluation, or, 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 or I guess we would call it an evaluation report on all the studies that had been done, all the epidemiological studies, there was a dozen or so, and they rated them. Uh, they they, they uh, summarized the health of the studies, and this study was they rated as uh, a low quality, um, and uh, they, that it showed a low positive association, and that it had insufficient evidence. Um, and this was the CDPHE under Larry Wolf, as they mean. 
Um, uh, so there was sort of an effort to, I felt personally, an effort to um, dismiss some of the studies that had been done. So Dr. McKenzie went back and in, in uh, 2019, she did another study and looked at the same, uh, the baby born with congenital heart defects. Um, and she looked at mother infant pairs and, and they were the pairs, the mother infant pairs with, where the infant had congenital heart defects were 1.7 times more likely than the controls, no congenital heart defect, to live in the highest density exposure group as compared to the low density group. And in rural areas, the likelihood was higher. So she uh, took, um, you know, took the information and uh, did a better study, which showed more of a connection. And a lot of the studies we're looking to look at, there's not enough, um, there's, there's, it's hard to get enough um, uh, observations to, for, for those studies to be um, the studies for those studies to be valid, and but they usually go in a direct going in a direction of pelvis. This is these, these outcomes that we're seeing over here. Uh, so the other impact that is associated with um, oil and gas development is um, increased risk of mild, moderate, and severe asthma. And a lot of the studies have shown an increase in emergency room admission for asthma for people of all ages. So um, I've just highlighted some of the negative impacts that have been observed, and we could go on and on and on. There's there's a lot more. There's a lot of evidence. Um, so uh, one of my questions is um, why is this still happening? Um, why is it still permitted when 84% uh, of original research studies on human health risk found signs of harm and indi indication of potential harm? Uh, there's enough evidence, certainly, there's enough evidence from epi studies to tell us that living near fracking operations is very, very likely to be harmful to some pregnant women and to children. Uh, Compared to 2017, we now have a much more, I think, open-minded and progressive Colorado Department of Public Health. Uh, theoretically, we've improved uh, the composition of our um, Colorado Oil and Gas um, um, Commission. And uh, we have a legal mandate with, with 181, and we're still, we're still having permits coming. So this is, um, I think, part of the problem is that there's not a definitive line for what is what is protective of public health and safety. Um, there's no magic number. So that's just a little bit about some of the health impacts of fracking. Um, it's certainly a lot more to that. So if you're interested, um, Christiane, shared a link to the fracking compendium, which is basically a summary of all we know about fracking thus far, um, a really useful resource. If you haven't taken a look at it yet, I strongly recommend that you do that. Um, somebody asked, um, is there a way to close these sites near residential um, areas? And uh, when we first met with Christian, it's a little bit of vulnerability. Um, he shared something with us that helped us um, focus our efforts. And he said that um, no, no well has been capped yet. Is that correct? On account of? So for all of the activist and legislative and elected official and organizational efforts, um, have we yet prevented a single well from being drilled? Maybe, but not entirely. Um, so and more pointedly to, to answer the question here that we have a, a fracking operation that's happening now that under the current rules with the COGCC that were adopted as a result of SB 19-181, um, which afforded local governments more control and changed the mission of the COGCC, et cetera, et cetera, no. This site, the, the Mayjay site, would not it would not be permitted, given where the houses are now. 
the problem is that these permits um, for May J, when they when it, they were issued in 2019, and the permits for Papa Joe and Yellowhammer when they were issued in 2017, houses weren't built up to that close a distance. Um, so under the COGCC rules at that time, and under the Weld County oil and gas regulations at that time, they were operating perfectly within their right to drill from those locations. So there is now a, a legal contract, a binding contract between the oil and gas operator, Weld County and the COGCC that affords them the permission to drill at, at those sites. Um, so as much as they've been, they've already been permitted, um, there's nothing left from a, a strict like regulatory kind of a perspective either by the COGCC or by Weld County and certainly by the town of Erie um, because these sites are just outside of the municipal boundaries of the town. There's nothing that they can do um, to stop what's happening now. I think knowing that really helps us in channeling our efforts. Um, we've focused a lot on getting quality air quality monitoring, quality air quality monitoring um, in Erie. <laughs> <laughs> because um, that would be a huge step in transparency and help us arm us with the information that we may need to at least cope with this activity near our homes. Um, but we are filing complaints. Um, we are attending all the meetings and we're not staying quiet, so. Yeah, I mean, there has been changes. Um, it was just mentioned in the video, but uh, and this is what makes it difficult too, because um, a couple years ago, um, SB 181 was passed that now makes it, um, you can't drill within 2000 feet of homes. So we were caught in this weird area where the, well was already approved and started drilling and then they didn't develop it because of um, economic downturn and then the pandemic which allowed home construction to catch up um, with and collide with this fracking process at the same time. Um, but we we can have the tools to feel better empowered and it's also we can always make our voice heard so to make uh, you can always contact the Board of Trustees, the Town of Erie, to advocate for strict oil and gas regulation um, and to cut down on the nuisances that come from oil and gas development. Um, you can contact the CDPHE, the Colorado Department of Health and Human Services, or Health and Environment, um, and the COGCC. Um, change is slow, uh, and we have these nebulous health impacts where we are fighting against fracking developed so fast within a decade before we could really measure the impacts. Um, and our, our general fear is that, you know, two decades from now, we'll look back and say, why did, why did we make this kind of like devil's bargain um, at the expense of public health? But the evidence right now is just not conclusive. So it's easy for policymakers to make baby steps towards um, coming to a, a greener future. Um, but we can always keep pushing. And another question just came in regarding the setbacks. So that, that's part of what's so tricky. So the town of Erie's current setbacks are at 2000 feet, but the sites are, are in unincorporated Weld County while our neighborhood Colliers Hill is in Erie. So a lot gets lost in that translation and the setbacks for unincorporated Weld County are only 500 feet, um, which, you know, is, they, is what it is. They were at the time. Yeah, they, so that's uh, that's part of what makes um, regulating these sites difficult um, and more difficult when they are annexed into um, places with different setbacks and jurisdictions. So lots yeah. of different things going on. And it's not to say that 2000 feet is a, a magical number where at 19,990 feet, that it's dangerous and at 2001 feet, all of a sudden it's safe. Um, the other issue there is that once you get about 2000 feet away from a well pad, you're not necessarily additionally burdened with the specific emissions from that well pad, but you are burdened with the emissions from every well in Weld County and the state of Colorado. So those, those 19,000 active wells in Weld County um, are all contributing to our negative air quality 
And that's what we all breathe day in and day out. Which, I mean, I hate to beat a, I don't know what the saying Dead is. Horse. Dead horse. But that's why air quality monitoring, continuous, independent air quality monitoring is so, so important. Um, I want to make sure that we get to the part where we talk about how you guys can file complaints um, and um, make your voices heard. So we're going to be posting uh, some emails and resources in the comments while Christian shares this portion. I'll be around afterward if you want to stick around and talk about any specific health concerns or if you want to just chat with some neighbors, um, feel free to stay um, after that. Yeah, so briefly, I just wanted to go through the, the process of how to file a complaint. And filing, calling it filing a complaint in the singular is probably the, the worst underestimation of the process here. Um, that what we have regionally and at the state level is a complete disconnect between the various state agencies. So if you ever file a complaint with the COGCC, the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission, about an issue with odor. You smell something bad and you had a nosebleed. Um, that information doesn't get transmitted to any other state agency. So in order for the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment, the CDPHE, to become aware of any health issues, you also have to file a complaint with them. So it's a, it's a very complicated process and um, there are various efforts underway to try to consolidate these various state reporting mechanisms to get these state agencies to communicate better with one another. But for the moment, it's, it really is a, a burdensome process and it's we the residents that bear that burden. So to that end, um, when you notice something that's amiss, um, please start by keeping a complaint log, whether it's a notebook, whether it's an app on your phone. Um, if you notice something, then start out by noting the date and time and the atmospheric conditions. So temperature and wind direction and speed and relative humidity, you can get all that from a, a nearby weather station, um, whether it's weather.com or weather underground, or if you have um, a little weather station in your backyard, any of those are sufficient. The next thing that's really easy is to take photos and video. Um, if your child gets a nosebleed, take a picture of it because that'll give you photographic evidence and it'll be date and time stamped. Um, if you notice unusual traffic, if there's a series of trucks that are using their engine brakes and it's loud, if you're noticing an odd plume of smoke from a site, um, take a photo, take a video and, and start documenting. Once you've got that in hand, um, there are, depending on the kind of nuisance that you're experiencing, whether it's noise or odor, um, or other health impacts, there's a, a large variety of folks that you can contact. And I've got a link down here um, for a, a guide on the Erie Protectors website on how to file a complaint. But briefly, the process is, first of all, if you smell gas in your home or if there's an emergency, please, please, please always call 911. Um, don't do any of these other things if it's an emergency. Call 911 and get it taken care of immediately. Afterward, um, for noise and odor issues, that the town of Erie has various ordinances that prevent nuisances from noise and odor. So you can call the non-emergency number for the Erie Police Department. Um, you can send an email to the town of Erie and the Board of Trustees. The, the first, like one of the first things that you'll do um, depending on which operator, whether it's Occidental or Crestone or extraction oil and gas, um, is that there are numbers that you can call, whether normal or emergency after hours numbers to notify the oil and gas operator of a nuisance. And that's one of the things that when you go to submit a complaint with the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission, they'll ask you to um, provide just hey, did, did you contact your local elected officials? Did you contact the operator? Did you contact X, Y, and Z? Um, so that, that's important to do before you file your complaint with the COGCC. So then you will finally file that complaint with the COGCC and or um, the CDPHE. 
and then you've done your best um, to notify the various local and state regulatory agencies and legislative bodies about the issues that you're experiencing as a resident. It's, you can also contact Weld County. Um, we yeah. have done that also, um, and they will come and do an inspection. If you're having health concerns, Christian went over this, but contacting the CDPHE is important, but also please also let the Erie Board of Trustees know. Um, and it helps us to know um, what's going on within the community so that we can help you advocate. So contacting um, one of us, um, we're on Facebook at the Collier's Hill Oil and Gas Monitoring Group. Um, you can also email me, I'm sharing my email on um the chat now and maybe other neighbors if you want to share your email too you can do that um those are just some of the things you can do to um file complaints and advocate for change in our community um sandra just one thing i heard was good. I heard this from Andrew. I think he's still on the call at Earthworks. That's often good if you file a complaint with the CUGCC or the um, CDPHE is to follow up right away with an email so they know who to connect and that um, also helps you get your voice heard too, which is another step. But it's um, Yeah, the follow up is very important. So if you've had the great privilege of uh, speaking at a COGCC meeting, um, the first thing they'll ask you is if you filed a complaint already. And the second thing is if you followed up when they contacted you. So um, doing those things um, will help you. Um... And I, you know, I think the broader takeaway is like the good news from this timeline is that the immediate nuisance from the fracking and the flow back and the big walls that we see up outside of our neighborhood, that will be going away soon. That will be going, the flow back will end and the walls will come down in the next few months. Um, but that doesn't, it's important to be aware of the larger situation with air quality in Colorado and the Northern Front Range. Um, and it doesn't really matter if you live here in Erie or if you lived in the Boulder side, um, the wind still flows west and we are all subject to um, the situation. And um, it can feel overwhelming trying to individually fight against these, you know, the support of oil and gas development in this uh, state. And it's also, it does provide a lot of jobs. It's, contentious as I'm sure everyone has seen in the local Erie and Collier's Hill pages. Um, but know that there's a larger community, we can still fight, band together to fight for information. Tangible change. Tangible change in terms of air quality monitoring so we know science that we can trust about what the situation is with our air, keep track of any health effects, get treatment from your doctors, notify them, um, and together we can build a better future. It doesn't have to be um, overwhelming. Yeah. One of the, uh, just on a point of vulnerability and um, one of the main reasons why I wanted to share this information with my neighbors was because it breaks my heart when I see small children and things, um, pets playing outside and either they don't know or they're um, just willfully unaware of what's going on in our area. And the more of us that um, acknowledge that it's a problem and are willing to talk about it, um, the better it'll be for our community. So thank you guys all for being here today. If you guys have any specific concerns or you wanna just chat with some neighbors, please feel free to stay behind. I'll stay for a little while longer, just answering any um, specific questions you guys might have. Um, otherwise you can reach out to us, email or messenger or whatever feels good to you. And a uh, special thanks to Christian. Thank you so much, sir, for, for leading the way and, and informing us as usual. And um, Kate and Colorado 350 for helping us host this and recording it. Um, so thank you all. We really appreciate you. Yeah, if you've got a question, just 